Hello, people. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Cool. Anyways, uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, today's presenter is an awesome person. And uh, I come to know her, you know, over the years that I've been at SIU. And what she's doing is a testament of how a nice university like SIUE collaborating with the community can actually achieve very big things. So I can assure you that the presentation is going to be really well received, as I've received it when she spoke to my faculty in December. Uh, our presenter is uh, Dr. Connie uh, Fresh Fallot. She's a sociologist and a sociologist professor at SIUE. Uh, I like your uh, bio on LinkedIn. She's a sociologist who's committed to dismantling hierarchies of oppression and building in their place flourishing relationships. Isn't that awesome? I really love that. Um, she's a busy person, as you'll see. Uh, she has uh, memberships in several organizations that are important to this community. For example, she's a member of the St. Louis Regional Higher Education Sustainability Consortium for several years. Um, she received her education from various places, uh, bachelor's and master's from uh, Middle Tennessee State University and a PhD from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Currently, apart from being a professor, she is the director of the SIUE Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Center. And also, we should be talking about today quite a bit. Uh, she's the director for the SIUE Successful Communities Collaborative. Uh, which is doing an amazing amount of work in our town. So with that, please uh, help me give Connie a nice rotary uh, welcome. Gosh, I'm a little, uh, maybe a lot humbled by, uh, by your words. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, let me do it from, there we go. That's a little, little more appeasing. Okay. So thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, I am uh, Connie, and I'm going to talk about a couple of these initiatives, both heavily invested in community engagement and centered on both furthering the skills and the higher education learning opportunities for our students and furthering the agendas of the partners that we uh, collaborate with. We started the Successful Communities Collaborative in 2017. So we've been doing this for five years now, about to start our fifth year. And it's based on this very simple question that came out of the University of Oregon in 2009. And it is just a simple question. What if we could connect what we're already doing at the university and what we already have access to, to our communities to help them address the challenges and the issues that they wanna see addressed? How simple is that? But also a bit innovative, right? So it came out of the University of Oregon, as I mentioned in 2009. It is uh, designed to enable students and faculty and other university folk to connect with communities, typically through municipal partnerships. But the model is quite flexible. And so what we see today is for approximately 60 institutions globally now, uh, about half of them domestic, but we have new EPIC, uh, it's called the EPIC Network, uh, Epic Network Affiliates in Africa, Asia, um, and uh, uh, South America as well. So quite a few uh, institutions around the world. And what that means is that we get to borrow from one another's expertise and knowledge, uh, and we're able to then uh, do better in our own institutions. So that's the basis of it. Well, here we go. I got ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, again, the Epic model has gone global now. Uh, and it exists on this rather simple, uh, again, framework. Uh, we respect existing structures, so we're not necessarily asking partners to change the way they do business. We're not asking our faculty or our students to do things differently. We're looking to embed projects and relationships in the structures, the courses, the organizations, the municipal units, et cetera, that already exist. We want to create mutually beneficial partnerships, genuine, genuine partnerships with our communities. Again, centering typically on local government, but we're seeing that the model works in, in collaborations with nonprofits and for-profit institutions as well. We intentionally aim at improving the quality of life. And so sustainability is really at the heart of that, but quality of life sometimes resonates a little bit better with folks. So we're thinking about how do we build communities so that they're safer, 
there's the better places to live, the education access is better, the health overall is improved, and people are happier because of those kinds of things. We focus, as I've already said, on community identified, driven, and evaluated contributions. So when I go into communities, I'm not going in to say SIUE is here to address this, that, and the other, or fix this, that, and the other. We're there to listen and to hear what is on your agenda. And oftentimes I start that conversation with a question such as, what's collecting dust, right? What have you maybe lost energy, momentum, or, or solved for some kind of reason? Those are wonderful opportunities and points of entry for students who have new ideas, right? Ideas that some of us might not be aware of opportunities and ways to problem solve, solve the problems that we're dealing with in ways that we haven't had a chance to come up with yet. And then we catalyze multiple disciplines in large numbers. So what we're doing is a little different than say an internship uh, or other kinds of one-off types of arrangements. When we partner, we partner for a minimum of one year. What we're finding also though, is that when we deal with real equity issues, those are issues that take longer than one year. And so we're seeing our partnerships start at one year and develop into multiple year partnerships. And that allows for us to deepen those connections and strengthen the relationships and better leverage uh, the resources of both of the partners, SIUE and our communities uh, to achieve the goals that we're looking for. It also means that we get this cross disciplinary type of approach as well. So when we engage in a project, uh, we think of it from different aspects so we you'll see some examples in fact where say construction students and sociology students and mass communication students are collaborating in a variety of ways around shared um, community identified projects so uh, we have partnered with uh, i think we're up to five or six communities now uh, we've been in a couple twice highland for example we're just finishing up a partnership with them uh, where we partner with the nonprofit uh, as well as the city institute, the city government. Um, we have nursing students helping think about programming at their new senior center. Uh, we have mass communication students thinking and providing tools like the one you see in the middle, uh, which is actually um, uh, a storyboard uh, that helps educate community members in Highland about the Silver Lake watershed. Um, and then we had students thinking about with the relationship with the Holly's House of Hope. Uh, about first person language. Holly's House serves young adults who have developmental disabilities, and the city is interested in developing pipelines between Holly's House and employment opportunities. And so, students again helped provide a platform, some tools that city employees could use to think about how to communicate and, and work with folks uh, with developmental disabilities. So, in March of this past year, uh, we had a uh, Dr. Jessica Harris, who was the original founder of the SAUE Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Center. Uh, I'll define that here in a moment. Uh, she was promoted to our first vice chancellor for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And when that happened, uh, the team, the TRHT team, asked me to move into the director's position of that effort. And so what we see now is this combination of the collaboration, the Successful Communities Collaborative, and this new focus, enhanced focus, I should say, on thinking about race, thinking about the institution's race uh, relationship with race and surrounding communities, as well as thinking about individual members of our community and our relationship with race and our involvement with racial equity, for example. And so the Truth Racial Healing Transformation Campus Center, again, is, is a uh, part of a network uh, this is a national uh, program uh, sponsored by the W.K. Kellogg uh, Foundation and uh, the American Colleges of University, American Association of Universities and Colleges. Uh, they provide the, the umbrella for the work. So there are approximately 30 institutions domestically that have adopted this framework uh, for bringing about transformational sustainable change and addressing those historic and contemporary effects of racism in particular. These are the goals that we have set for our institution under that, uh, that idea of telling the truth about our relationship with race and racial equity, about doing so so that we, become, we move into a healing phase so that we can transform into communities that thrive together so that we become stronger together after doing this truth telling and healing uh, from uh, the conditions that we find ourselves in. 
I'm going to spend most of the time or the rest of the time I have focusing on goal number one, narrative change, and the truth telling piece, because that's where our students have really um, have been the, the most involved. Uh, but you see that goal of focuses on uh, in equipping our campus and community stakeholders with knowledge, skills, and courage to tell the truth regarding the ways in which racism has impacted our campus, our region, and our relationships. So narrative change. We're going to focus on, uh, in terms of our narrative change efforts, on the community of East St. Louis. And we're doing that for a few reasons. Uh, but for now, I'll just shortcut it and say we're doing it because that's where our university started. That's where SAUE's first campus was. Uh, and since that first initial relationship, there's been tension, we'll say. The relationship has not been healthy. It has not been ideal. And so there's a lot of energy now uh, among our campus units and members to think about how do we repair those relationships? How do we tell the truth, first of all, again, about the nature of the relationship, say, between the Edwardsville campus and the East St. Louis campus and community so that we can heal and be a stronger university together, right? <laughs> And the way that we're doing it, again, where students are really shining is, is through storytelling, digital stories about people who call East St. Louis home. And so we're drawing on the Honor Center, for example, the Center for Digital Humanities on our campus. Uh, these digital stories are drawn from oral histories that, that sociology and Black theater workshop students have been primarily responsible for collecting. And again, they are stories from people who either still reside in East St. Louis or they once called it home, uh, like you see here, Dr. Wesley Robinson McNeese, uh, who is a native of East St. Louis and also um, a leader at the Springfield School of Medicine, uh, part of the SIU system. And we're doing so, as you can see, to highlight these lived experiences from the inside out, right? So much of what we know about a community like East St. Louis is dominated by a negative media narrative. But when we hear the stories from the individuals that call it home, have a connection to it, belong, and have a sense of belonging to the community, it reveals a different truth. So our goals with these stories are to revise that dominant narrative about East St. Louis and its residents and develop the relationships between our Edwardsville and our East St. Louis community members uh, and bring this disembodied racial equity data to light to highlight how race has impacted uh, the stories in this case of residents. Students engaged thus far, uh, this is a quick overview of students, students from uh, capstone courses in sociology, again, have been leading the charge and collecting those oral histories as part of their uh, methodology and, and theoretical skill development. Uh, Black Theater Workshop has collaborated with those folks, students, and in fact, the, the past spring performance uh, which I think I have a slide on the next uh, on the next uh, go round here uh, that shows you the, at least a screenshot. And I encourage you to go look at those videos uh, that were created, inspired by the stories that students collected. Uh, again, we have a number of mass comm students who are coming in to work with uh, the data that we've collected to collect new stories, new video, new audio, uh, and new social media. Again, to shift that narrative and to get these stories out and. Um, uh, the general public. Here's a, a, we don't have time to necessarily watch, but there's a four part series uh, titled East St. Louis. And again, these are stories that are inspired by the oral histories that the Black Theater Workshop students and the sociology students collected. Uh, really beautiful um, series of performances. So uh, I encourage you again to uh, check those out. And now uh, SSCC, the collaborative, has just recently, in fact, just last month, uh, officially partnered with the city of East St. Louis to enhance, again, uh, the relationship that we've been developing through those digital stories. So partnering with the municipality, uh, we started by uh, participating in a family fun fest found, uh, put together by the Emma L. Wilson King Foundation. I, I bring this photo because I just frankly love it. Uh, Haley and Lizzie had a great time uh, working with the community and engaging with folks and learning about uh, stories that people brought to the fun festival. Uh, but I also show it because part of what we do when we work with municipalities and other organizations is we pull important stakeholders into that conversation. So we're partnering with the city, 
but the King Foundation uh, is an important stakeholder and we work with them and identify, uh, again, listen to hear what their needs are. And you see some of that here as well. So we're also leveraging and working with the Katherine Dunham Centers for the Arts and Humanities. Our construction students have been central and I'll, I'll show some photos here in a moment of, of the work that they've been doing. In an attempt to be multi and cross disciplinary, we've been embedding students from other classes. And in the last semester, we embedded sociology students into those construction teams so that they were balanced. And, and while the construction teams are thinking about designs, budgets, materials, the sociology students were able to help them think about what it means to build in a community and how to engage and encourage community members to be part of that work and how students can in return be part of the work of those community organizations. We've had economic students helping uh, the community development director think about new finance streams. A lot of municipalities are interested in such things. And so uh, Professor Clemens and students uh, put together some scenarios of what if this fee were created or what if this uh, incentive were offered? Uh, what would be the consequences? So again, the city has a little more information to make a decision uh, to further their agenda. Uh, we also have now, I, I've already shown you uh, the, uh, the Jones Park um, uh, efforts, uh, but we also now are bringing in some nutrition students uh, to provide some nutrition outreach education. Here's that Catherine Dunham uh, Centers uh, for the Arts and Humanities project that we are working with. Olivet Park is known as the Mansion District in East St. Louis. It's where the high level managers and owners of industry lived uh, when East St. Louis was in its heyday. Uh, the fellow you see there with his hands out uh, is John Cabbage. He is a new faculty member. He's the chair of the construction management program. And he's actually speaking to Meg Smith, one of our members of the Digital, Iris, uh, Digital Humanities Center, the Iris Center. So we have faculty, we have students, we have lots of community members engaged in this project. You see a list of uh, other stakeholders, again, showing how we try to reach broadly into the community and, and pull people together uh, to leverage all of the resources and energy uh, that we have together. And so what are they doing? Uh, these three properties are just down the street from the Kathleen Dunham Museum, if you know where that property is. Uh, the home furthest, so to the left uh, on the screen, uh, was where Kathleen Dunham lived. Uh, the two properties adjacent to that, she also owned and used those for community education types of meeting spaces. Um, that you see that the homes have fallen into great disrepair. Uh, after she passed, they changed hands a number of times. And at the beginning, actually this time last year, they were on the mayor's demolition list because of the condition. Uh, they were in much worse condition than what you see here uh, prior to uh, this new energy brought by both the Captain Dunham Center along with all of those stakeholders you saw listed previously. Community members, our students, our faculty, staff folks got involved, cleaned those properties up and got them off that demolition list. They were on that list, by the way, because they sit across the street from a school and the mayor has a pretty clear school ordinance. He does not want his children walking to school in treacherous conditions. And so uh, it was pretty vital uh, that these properties be cleaned up or they were going to be lost. So in addition to just doing cleaning up and hands on kind of labor that you see here, John's students, and this was the first cleanup day uh, with lots of our community members and, and stakeholders and, and students mixed in. John's students work closely with the, the board president of the Captain Dunham Foundation of Centers for the Humanities and Arts and develop budgets and materials lists and timelines for renovating the three properties. His students in the spring will turn to look more specifically at more discrete and, and more detailed, deeper types of projects. So for example, one group of his students will be looking at uh, designing an amphitheater behind the museum. And they're already going thinking about using the Buckminster Fuller influence that we have in our region as a design model for the amphitheater. Other students will be thinking about how to landscape the properties, these three properties, as well as the museum in such a way that mitigates flooding, right? The climate change impact that we know that municipalities are dealing with. There are a couple of other groups that are working along those lines as well. And then a, a direct shift, because I think I'm running close on time here, our, our last major partnership that is just beginning 
is actually one that has been generated at the system level. So the SIU system is now looking to be more collaborative amongst itself. So Edwardsville, Carbondale, Springfield, working more closely together and leveraging all of our shared resources to the benefit of communities. And so we're seeing that manifest here in the partnership with Venice, Madison, and Brooklyn, where there is a pretty lofty agenda uh, working very closely with the mayors, the leadership, and the community members there uh, to, uh, to establish a new grocery store to improve access to food, uh, to fresh food and healthy food, uh, to establish medical care facilities, because right now it's very difficult to access care, uh, a workforce development center, affordable housing, uh, certainly uh, infrastructure, again, bringing in, I didn't say this, but we work very hard to bring in uh, grants uh, to support some of these high dollar types of goals that our partners have. And we've been some, somewhat successful with that. Uh, so with that, I am going to um, stop and see if you have any questions. I encourage you to follow us. Um, let me know if you'd like to have a conversation to learn how you might be involved in one of our existing partnerships. Or um, while we have a lot going on, I'm always open to a conversation about a new partnership. So I, again, at this time, I will entertain any questions or comments uh, from, from the group. You only focus on one question because they take about a year, like no less than a year. Right, right. But you can have multiple going on. Like, oh, we do. Yes, we do. Oh, yes, yes, we do. Um, as, as you see, we, we are pretty heavily involved in East St. Louis. We're still finishing up a Highlands uh, partnership, uh, and we are uh, in the Venice, Madison, Brooklyn community. And we're also in conversation with Austin. We've been in our, actually, we were in Austin in our inaugural year, and they've invited us back to have a conversation. Um, after Austin, by the way, we were also here at Edwardsville. Uh, so that was in 2019, 2020. We had a little hiccup, um, you know, COVID kind of popped up in the middle of, of that partnership. So, uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are similar studios. Yeah. Where would we find those? YouTube, um, FAUE, uh, uh, theater, and dance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, I, I mean, I'm kind of biased and partial to them, but um, <coughs> pretty phenomenal, uh, I'll just tell you. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, Kathy Bentley, the director of Black Theater Workshop, invited a former student back to be the special guest director. Uh, so it's, it's just off. SAU students, phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, her home uh, is planned to be uh, where the Catherine Dunham Center will actually be physically located. Uh, they're imagining that there could be conference room space that could be available for rental in that, in that room, in that building. Uh, they're imagining a STEM center for the community children as well. The two adjacent properties, they are currently imagining as maybe Airbnb or other types of housing, maybe housing for students or housing for dancers, right? Who come, who want to come and kind of really live and, and experience that Catherine Dunham legacy there. So lots of ideas still early. And um, we have a four o'clock meeting actually to talk about grant for capital development on those properties today too. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for Tony? Also, on behalf of the nursery and the Tosky family, Tony, I'd like to present you today's centerpiece. Take a moment.